Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Enjoying day one of Clio? Yeah, me too. It's great to be back after three years. Um, so my name is Billy Tarasio. It's great to see all of you here. Today is a workshop, which I've never actually done before, so bear with me. But what we're going to do is talk about some stuff and then figure out how it applies to you and so that you can work on how it might apply to you and hopefully take something back for yourself or your firm. Um, a couple of lovely, amazing Clio people are going to be handing out a handout to you pretty soon. When you get that, just go ahead and pass it on uh, and we will take it from here. All right. So my name is Billy Tarasio. I am the owner of Modern Law, which is a family law firm in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, we are, let's see, we opened in 2010, so we're about 12 years old, and have consistently been a fast growing law firm. A uh, year after year, we grow, we add new people, we try new things, we're fairly innovative. And um, currently, we are a team of about 30 people always looking to add new amazing paralegals and lawyers. If anyone is interested in practicing family law in Arizona, we're always hiring. But because of that, culture has been um, a focus and a challenge for me as a law firm owner. It has been pretty easy to handle a lot of things in the law firm, like office space or getting clients or adopting technology, but figuring out how to get teams all moving in the same direction or add new people seamlessly or adjust to people leaving and coming while also dealing with everything that everybody has dealt with in the last two years has been the most challenging part for me as a law firm owner without a doubt so today here's our agenda we're going to talk about what is your culture today what is your law firm culture today what are your personal values? Do they match? Do your policies that are in place promote your values? And then once you figure out what that culture is, how do you make sure that you are not simply hiring the same type of person over and over and over again, but you are hiring for culture ad, not just a culture fit? So that's our agenda for today. It is hard to lead people. How many of you are law firm owners? Okay, great. How many of you are lawyers who are not owners? Okay. And how many of you are work in a law firm and you're not a owner or a lawyer? Wow. I'm so glad that like all of you are here with your diverse backgrounds. Every single one of you is a leader in your law firm. Whether you are a lawyer, a non-lawyer, the owner or not the lawyer, not the owner, you are impacting your culture and you are a leader in your firm and you are either adding to your culture or you're detracting from your culture. So I'm so glad that all of you are here from your very diverse backgrounds. What is culture? This surprised me a little bit, the definition of culture. I wonder if it comes up. Yes, it does come up. Look at that prettiness. Culture is the attitudes and the behaviors of employees within an organization. Does that surprise anybody else? It surprised me because it means it's not the law firm owner's job to just create a culture. I really always thought it was my job. And if we had a culture problem, it was a me problem. And certainly leadership matters. But culture is a lot more than just leadership. It's a lot more than just policies. It is whether or not your people hit their billable hour goals. It's whether or not your people gossip about one another. It's whether or not it's how your people treat your clients. It's how they talk about clients in front of clients and not in front of clients. It's the language they use. It's the outfits they show up in. It's how they talk to one another face to face. It's how lawyers treat people who work under them, like paralegals and legal assistants, all of these things are your culture. And it's difficult to maintain a positive culture all the time because we're talking about groups of humans. 
So many things influence company, company culture, the work environment, whether or not you work from home, your missions, your values, your policies, your leadership, your goals. But it really comes down to the collective of the attitudes and behaviors of employees. So there are, on a very high level, there are four different types of cultures from the highest level. Hierarchy, a hierarchical culture, a clan culture, a market culture, and an ad hocracy. And so I want to talk for a minute about what those are. Okay. A hierarchical culture is the most common, traditional, cultural uh, framework that exists, right? Uh, we have, you know, owners and managing partners and uh, within, you know, directors and managers and just very hierarchical culture. And it, and it comes with it, a defined structures, levels of authority, um, and there's pros and cons to that, right? It's pretty rigid. It doesn't allow for a lot of flexibility. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it promotes the best communication or ideas. I personally, I don't like it, <laughs> but it does work. It has some, some pros and there are a lot of people who love the hierarchical culture. You'll see this typically in very large organizations and it can equate to efficiency and stability, but you're losing some flexibility and some creativity. The next type of culture that you may have is a clan culture. And a clan culture is more like a family where people are very connected by personal relationships. They depend on one another like a clan, almost like a little communist unit where everybody works together and they, they communicate really well and everybody does their job. Um, and this is what we had for a long time before we outgrew it. Uh, and it worked pretty well, um, but it doesn't work really well when you have a large group or when you don't have enough structure or rules in place. So like for instance, when we were small, we had an unlimited vacation policy. Um, and now this is not to say that big companies can't have an unlimited vacation policy. Clio has an unlimited vacation policy. I just didn't know how to make an unlimited vacation policy work when we outgrew the clan culture. So I don't want to say that that won't work, but that's the type of thing that you have to figure out how to do that maybe will work with the clan, but won't work when you get bigger. Employee engagement is very high with clan cultures. There's a lot of good things about clan cultures. Um, many family owned businesses are clan cultures, but if you have a business that works like a family, sometimes you let a lot of behavior go that you wouldn't let go if you didn't love each other quite so much. <laughs> How many of you uh, have clan cultures in your firms? Okay, okay, all right, great, all right. And can I ask, how many people have hierarchical cultures? Many, fewer, that's surprising to me at least. All right, ad hocracy. I think this is what we have now at Modern Law. These, um, I think Apple and Google are also ad hocracies, they have Clan nature, small clans within an organization that's larger that has to have more bureaucracy in place. So you've got more of the hierarchical aspects plus clan aspects can equal this um, ad hocracy. How many people think they have an ad hocracy? Okay, spattering. All right. And this type of group can work pretty quickly, can get the benefits of the of the hierarchical and the clan. Hopefully that's what they're going for, at least. And then there's market cultures. Now, I don't know that very many um, law offices are market cultures. Those are companies like Netflix or like Clio, companies that are really watching the competition in industries that are evolving super fast and they have to be the most fast paced. They like, for instance, one of the books I just recently read on culture, which I highly recommend is called No Rules Rules about Netflix. And they don't make five year plans because they don't know what the industry is going to look like in five years. So anybody think they're part of the market culture? No, very interesting. All right, so is what you have right now what you want? I mean, most of you are part of clans, 
does that work for you? Does that resonate with you? Does it drive you crazy that certain people maybe don't pull their weight? Does it really irk you? Are you in a clan, but you desperately wish that you had hierarchy and structure? Many of my people really would like more structure. So we have been working towards that in order to give them what they want. But is what you have currently what you want? Silence. This is a workshop. <laughs> have we um, have we passed out the color test yet? Yes, we have. We're working on it. Great. Okay, great. Um, so that's the first thing that I'd like you to reflect on. Which of those four things feels best to you individually? And is the environment that you're in meeting your overarching needs for what you want in your culture? And then the next thing that we're going to talk about is completely switch gears. And we're going to talk about um, personality testing and why it matters. So the first time that this came up for me was in 2013. And um, my law firm at that point in time was maybe six to 10 people, I think. And we were not doing very well. Um, there was a lot of fighting of people with each other. And there was a lot of complaining about our clients. And there was a lot of people who were just unhappy and coming to me with their problems and asking me to solve their problems. And I was desperately running from problem to problem to try to solve everyone's problem. And I thought that that was my job. And I was failing at it. Like I, I was doing everything I possibly could and I was failing at it. So I hired a consultant to come in and like do, help me figure it out. Like this was beyond my capability. And we did our very first retreat, which we now do regularly, but we didn't at that time. And it was in this restaurant and we'd rented out a banquet and people went in there so nervous and they were pretty sure they were going to be duking it out. They were pretty sure that by the end of the day, they were going to be proven right. And so-and-so was going to fall in line. And that's how they thought this was going to go down. And instead, these two ladies um, gave us this test and tested our personalities and talked to us about how we might view the world and how our conflicts might come from the fact that we are different personalities. So at this point, I will just tell you about what happened in my law firm. And maybe you all can guess which colors you are. So in this personality test, there's four different colors that you can be. And it sounds like people were not excited about the color test. They were not excited about talking about their personalities and their feelings when they really wanted to duke it out. They really wanted to be in the restaurant talking about who was wrong and who was right and how we were going to fix our problems. Has anyone ever had that happen in their law firms? Please raise your hands. I can't be the only one. <laughs> so um, we took these tests and uh, let's just talk about what these colors mean. And eventually you will have these this test and you can take the colors as well. And there is something to this because we were on a law firm retreat last week in Puerto Vallarta and one of our person's um, spouses works for Chevron and they have their color at the bottom of their email signature within Chevron. So there is something to this personality testing impacting law firm culture and the ability to communicate. You and the test is super easy and eventually you'll get it. But you are an orange personality if you are a risk taker. Monotony is the worst thing in the world for you. You must have the ability to have freedom and flexibility in the way that you work. And that um, that type of hierarchical culture where you need to stay in your lane and only ask about matters to you. Hello. OK, great. Um, <laughs> You would hate that, right? You would hate that. You, you're social, you're outgoing, you're experimental, you're extroverted, you need variety. Anybody think they're an orange? All oh, right, I love you. I'm an orange. Um, now, golds are, maybe their counterpart a little bit. Golds are police officers. So oranges are like rock stars and actors and um, entrepreneurs. I think Ronald Reagan was orange. Like they're just sort of gregarious and big and golds are rule followers. They need a plan. They wanna know what the rules are. They always follow the rules. They are traditional. They don't like risk taking. 
They want to know what's happening. They really want predictability. Now, these people are amazing at executing systems within your law firm. They are amazing at building systems, at building rules. If you as a leader haven't provided the rules, they're going to come up with those rules. They um, can be rigid. They, there's a certain way the dishwasher needs to be loaded. If you do it wrong, okay, so we have some golds. Who thinks there are golds? Great. What, what are we laughing about? <laughs> Dishwashers, okay, staplers. Let's say you, you sit in a gold's desk and you use their space and you don't leave it the way that it was. That's a big problem. Now, if you have an orange who sits in a gold's desk every other day because their desk is a mess, so they sit in yours because yours is great and then they mess it up, that's gonna create a problem, right? Or let's say you're a gold and you're a paralegal and you have set this lawyer up for perfection. You have given them exhibits that are perfectly marked and in order and they're on their desk and they're on time and the orange blows it off until the day before and then says, never mind, I didn't want it this way. Do it differently. We are laughing because this happens all the time in our firms, right? All the dang time, yeah. Well, this is why the color test and the conversation that we had in that restaurant mattered because it allowed the oranges to start seeing things from the gold's personality and honoring where they were coming from. Blue, blues are nurses and teachers. They're affectionate, they're compass compassionate, they're steadfast, they're nurturing. They have a small circle of close friends and they have their own rules that they live by that they execute consistently and flawlessly. So they're not like the golds where they're like, tell me the rules. They have their own set of rules for their life that matter very much to them. And they hate people who are insensitive and they are some of the very best lawyers because they are so compassionate. They will give and give and give and give. And they are very offended by insensitivity and they sometimes have a really hard time setting a boundary and protecting their own emotional boundaries. Who's the blue? We have some blues. Blues are so amazing. We don't, we don't have a lot of blues in here. Blues are, they're the best. They're great. Greens are the final color. Greens are academic, analytical, very, very, very smart stubborn, willful. They think they know better than everyone. They, they're not necessarily open to other people's opinions right off the bat. And they can be very insensitive because being right is more important than somebody's feelings. A lot of lawyers are green. Who's a green? Not very many. I call BS. Like, I bet that there are more greens in here. Come on, you guys are academic, you're smart, you're analytical, you're like, give me the data. You, you see things, you think quickly. If you're in an argument and somebody is like, I can't handle this, I need to walk away and process what you're saying, I can't have this conversation, you're, you're angry. You wanna have the conversation. Tell me again, who's a green? Okay, that's better. I, I believe you more now. So greens and blues can have a real problem because greens are really focused on the bottom line and blues very much care about how you feel and how you got there. It matters. So you can see how these personalities, understanding where each other are coming from, can have a real impact on culture and can really help you start interacting with one another in a different way, right? So hopefully Tasha's passing out more tests, but what I'd like you to do, if you have paper or you have your phone, I would like you, because this is a workshop, jot down your team or your, your close team. You know, you're the closest five to eight people that you work with and think about what's your color and what's their color. And then I want you to think about what are some conflicts that you see between people and then I'm going to ask you to share it so we can talk about how this affects law firm culture. Okay. So you have about 10 minutes. 
So the other question while you work, you don't have to listen to me and you can go ahead and talk to each other. But the other question was, can you be arranged? And yes, you can absolutely be arranged. And um, what's interesting is some people in my law firm were pretty balanced. They were not necessarily hugely gold or hugely green. They were pretty well spread out. And those people, unsurprisingly, seem to have the least conflicts with people. But for those of you who might really be gold, like that's your color. The other things are really pale in comparison. You're going to see that the, the world in a very concrete way. And that is what is most important to you. And so you might find yourself having a lot of conflicts with people who do not see the world that way. And you may need to work for an organization or you may be happier working for an organization that operates in a very gold structured way. Like maybe you would be a cop or an auditor or something like that. So is anyone who, who is done and you've done the test for yourself and you've thought about your coworkers, would anyone care to share what are some typical conflicts they see in their law firm and how it relates to these colors? <laughs> I'm the director of operations at our firm. And um, when you're reading this, I thought, oh, I'm totally gold. I did it and I'm 15 green, 15 blue, 14 gold, six in orange. And when I looked at my coworkers, so we have a director of legal services, and her and I, it's like, we don't even have to talk to communicate. We get each other. And I think she's the exact same as me. Mm -hmm. Our owner is orange for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have um, kind of our systems and organization person, and she's green, and she kind of creates a lot of conflict. How so? Um, she pushes against anything that gets changed that's not her idea. Mm. Yeah. They can be contrarian. Yeah, so it's hard. We're growing fast, and we need her to like move with us. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's going to happen. And I, it's interesting, because I find that I, our director of finance seems more blue to me. Mm -hmm. So Does she have a problem collecting money? <laughs> she doesn't, but it's just like her personality yeah. seems more yeah. kind of nurturing. I think it makes conversations easier. That's what I think. I think when I go to have a conversation with somebody and there's conflict, like this, um, did you say the director of operations is the green one who's creating conflict? She's kind of like the assistant to operations. So she is having a hard time getting on board with ideas that are not hers. This can be a problem that we greens have. I happen to be green and orange. It was helpful to, to temper my own behaviors and my own instincts as a green and an orange to understand that these things can be used for good, but they have a flip side, right? Every single personality has a flip side. And when we understand how our superpowers can negatively impact others, we can start making changes to our behavior and be a little bit more understanding of where other people are coming from. So this is why I think that this is an extremely important tool that we can use, both for communication, for self-knowledge, and for understanding each other better, which I think is crucial to culture. Anything, anything else that anybody wants to share before we move on? Yes. I say my score is 14, 15, 16, 15 on there. Um, my managing attorney is a blue, and our lead senior paralegal is a yellow. And it just, it made my eyes open, like, oh. Because literally, she's like, why are y'all, it's very rigid with her, and she has a very short temper um, for the compassion that our managing attorney has for, you know, just employees and clients. It's like, but well, we can just get it done. And it's like, no, you have to kind of work with people. So, I mean, this is truly like a aha, you know? <laughs> It was an aha for me too. <laughs> it really was. And that was in 2013. And uh, we, we still use it. We're also using the Enneagram, which is eight different types. And they all do the same thing. They help facilitate conversations and they help us to know each other better. Now, we're gonna switch gears again. First, we talked about the four different types of cultures. 
Then we talked about personalities and how that can impact your culture. Now we want to talk about your values. What are your values? This is one of these things. How many people have taken the time to write down their law firm values or your law firm has values that are written down? How many people have done that? Okay, I'm gonna say about 40%. Now, for those of you, I'm gonna ask another question. For those of you that have your values written down, are they words or are they paragraphs? How many of you have your values written down in paragraphs? Raise your hand. Okay. Catch phrases with explanations, okay. All right, how many people have explanations? Like more than two sentences? Okay, 10% maybe, all right. So values exercises. The first thing, let's see, I learned about values a long time ago, right? You gotta have your values written down. We did this the first time and it came out like, you know, excellence, professionalism, responsibility, like it was just, it was garbage. It was garbage. Like it did not actually do anything to articulate the values of the firm at all. So then I went to, it was actually a Clio talk a long time ago with somebody who actually described culture and she described like what is the difference in the Google culture and the Facebook culture and the Apple culture, right? These are all the same company, right, to us. They're not. They have very different cultures and very different values. And then she described what that actually looked like and what that meant. So we went through the exercise of, of spending a lot of time to figure out what our values were. And then we articulated those values, but it's not enough to articulate the values. You have to, you have to describe what they mean, how they get executed how they play out. So now our values are, I mean, they're long, but like growth is a value. And we describe what that means. You know, we value the growth of our clients. We don't see them as somebody who's at our doorstep to get a divorce today. We think about what does their journey look like while they are our clients? How do we help them grow? How do we envision what that family looks like and how they're impacted later? We are, as a company, are committed to growth. It is what it is. Sometimes it's disruptive. We are up from last year, year to date, 54%. It's a little crazy, but growth is part of our values. It's never gonna change. Um, and we value individual growth. Nobody has to be perfect. Nobody has to be perfect, but everybody has to be willing to grow. So this is an example of how growth is a value and how it gets applied. Now we took it a step further and we turned it into a constitution. The constitution is really cool because it has a preamble you know, we the people in order to uh, form a more perfect union, right? Why do we exist? The mission is the preamble. So we have a preamble. And then we have, the, the Constitution has structural aspects, right? Three branches of government. You've gotta be 35 to be president. So we've got policies that are like the way it works, the structure of the company, how it works, how everybody has a voice, but ultimately it's my, it's my job to decide because we're a single owner firm. We have, you know, we're, we fall under the Supreme Court of Arizona and the ethical rules. Like it talks about what is the structure. Then it has the values. Now, why does that matter? Why is that useful? One of the things that we have struggled with in my office for a million years is figuring out a, a proper work from home and PTO policy. Anybody else struggle with that? Did I hear a, uh, did I? <laughs> like, it's really hard because we, I, val I have four kids. I started my law firm when I had kids. I value flexibility. I believe that we, that people work the best way they work when they work. I do not want to micromanage people. I believe that fundamentally. And at the same time, you must have accountability, right? So we have struggled with figuring out what are the boundaries of work from home. I know it works. Some people have no problem working from home, right? It's only certain people that you struggle with that work from home. Am I right? Yeah. So uh, we, 
and it changed, right? This struggle that we've had at Modern Law from work from home has has evolved, right? Because we we had the ability to work from home before COVID, then COVID hit, then everybody worked from home. Now everybody works from home anytime they want, but that doesn't mean the problems went away. We didn't have a good policy. Like if you leave for half a day, is it fine? Do you have to take PTO or not? I allow you to flex your time, so what does that mean, right? Well, finally we went to the Constitution and we read the value. I don't know why this took me so long. We read the value that was mobility and accessibility and the value which was written out, which was a, a nice paragraph, said that our work environment provides a high level of flexibility in terms of how and when we work. Most positions or functions don't have to be performed in the office. Each individual is encouraged to work where they are most productive while maintaining effective communication with clients and team members. In the event that an individual is not meeting expectations with regards to productivity or communications, then the individual may be asked to work within the office. That last line wasn't in the Constitution, but the Constitution gave me the clarity to know how to write the policy from work from home, finally. The value in the Constitution says people should be able to work how and when they want while maintaining communication and productivity. So then I had to think about how are we defining, how do we quantify productivity and communication? Productivity is easy, right? That's dollars in the door for if you're a billable employee. If you're not a billable employee, it's some other metric, but we can figure out how to measure productivity. Communication, we came up with a new way to measure. It's a single survey that goes out each month where each employee rates the people they work with and they're asked a single question on a scale of one to 10, are you getting the communication you need from your coworkers to do your job most effectively? New policy says if you're below a seven, your manager's gonna create a plan. If it happens two months in a row, you're gonna be asked to work in the office. This is a policy I feel really good about. It ties the expectation of work from home to what is required for them to be accountable, but it's within the framework that I feel good about. Like you, if you are communicating and you're productive, work from home all day, every day. But if you're not, you're gonna be asked to come to the office. And if I didn't have the Constitution written down, we would, we would still be struggling with this <laughs> because it is not, it's just not an easy thing. Do any of you have examples of policies in your office and how they relate to your values? We have a um, similar value in flexibility in where you work and how you work. And that has resulted recently in a work from anywhere policy. Um, that allows people to work internationally or somewhere else in the United States for an extended period of time and what they have to do to be eligible for that and how that works. And that came out of our value, not only the flexibility, but also kind of a culture we have of travel that just happens to exist in our workplace. Love it. Yeah, travel, um, that we value that and value the experiences that gives to our employees. And so we actually encourage that quite a bit to get out into the world and continue working from wherever you can. So we have another breakout. I want you to take a little bit of time, turn over your paper and jot down what are your values personally? What is important to you, like fundamentally to your core, important to you? And does your work environment support fundamentally to your core what is important to you? Does anyone have anything that they would be willing to share? Hi. Uh, as I thought about it, uh, we also value flexibility, uh, a growth mindset that we're purpose driven, that we have an outcome for ourselves individually and professionally, that we want to reach an end state, that we're independent, and that we respect each other and have balance. I love that. There's a lot of values there. Anyone else willing to share? So one of our founding partners is now a coach as well, and she has us do our standards of integrity whenever we started working at the firm, which is where we basically list out who do we value most in our lives, home, personal, work, everywhere, and what do you value about them? And then those are your integrities. You value those and those people because that's your standard of integrity. So I'm looking at like constitution and our values and thinking that 
maybe we should do a standard of integrity that applies to like the firm. Like if our if our firm was had its own standard of integrity, what would that look like? And that would help us start expanding our values because our values right now are words, which are wonderful words, but I like the idea of the Constitution. So that's kind of my thought about jumping off. I love that. When when we figured out our values, I wanted to think about what does it mean for how this applies to our clients and how we practice law, and what does this mean for how the company treats and values its employees. So I really wanted to expand, and now taking it a step further to figure out how does it affect our policies. It's just a really useful like framework because it's so hard to make these decisions. So thank you for sharing that. Anybody else? That's awesome. It's so awesome. Did you guys all hear that? She said in their firm they celebrate mistakes. They have young associates. They know that they can't grow without mistakes. And so when people share those mistakes, they're celebrated in the firm, which is just awesome. Glorious failures. Glorious failures. Um, the last section of today's workshop, and then we'll, we'll open it up to just questions or comments or ideas you all have, is hiring for culture fit versus culture ad. So one of the things that has happened in the great Silicon Valley, in these pioneering companies like Apple and Google and Facebook that figured out their culture and started hiring for culture is that everybody started looking the same, right? And what we don't want to do is use our culture to limit our growth or discriminate against people who are different from us. We have to figure out a way to find people that add to us and that add to our culture and fit it without looking at candidates and thinking if they don't look and sound and act like everybody else that they don't belong here, right? So how do you attract the very best candidates? Um, this is a picture from a, our 10th our anniversary, we did a, a cruise and we did a retreat on this cruise. And one of the things we figured out there is that we had a hiring problem. We didn't really have a structure for hiring and I just hired anybody that, that like I met, that I liked, which was everybody and that, that created problems. Orange, orange, like everybody's fabulous, let's do it, it'll be amazing, that was a problem. So we came up with hiring guidelines, which were beautiful, and they, and we're still working on that, right? Because you're never done. Once you fix a problem, it doesn't mean you're done, it just means you're done for the moment, and then you have to come back to it. But um, figuring out what does my hiring guidelines look like will help you figure out how to attract people to your culture who are culture ads. Um, and celebrating who you are and putting that in your job descriptions will also help. Like showing people like, who are you? Celebrating your employees on social media, lifting them up and promoting them will help you attract people who want to be part of what you are doing. And the other thing is like, you can be open to new opportunities. This lovely lady right here, Megan um, is a certified divorce financial analyst who lives in New Orleans. We are a law firm in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, she applied for a paralegal job. And she's a great paralegal, but she's a lot more than a paralegal. She's a certified divorce financial analyst. How many family law firms have those? Well, we do. <laughs> we now have full-time certified for divorce financial analyst, and we'll probably add more. And she's in New Orleans, and it works great. And she's this amazing culture ad. She is a different culture. She's a different mentality. She brings a different skill set. That is a culture ad. So it doesn't just have to be... It doesn't have to just be about, it could be about geography, it could be about mentality, it can be about age, it can be about race, it could be about socioeconomic status, it can be about anything if you're willing to look creatively and openly to different things. So is it worth it to spend all this time on culture 
to, to, to try so hard to make people get along and create an environment that functions well and that moves people forward in a way that they honor and respect one another. And you guys are all on the same page. Is it worth it? I mean, I think it is. What does my team think? There's like six or seven of them here. You guys think it's worth it? I mean, they have to say yes, right? Okay. <laughs> It's not even a real question. All right. For those of you who work on law firm culture, is it worth it? Yes. Why is it worth it? Joy. People are the heart of everything we do. We spend a lot of time together. What else? It's more fun. What else? Increased productivity. People stay longer if they're in the right spot, right? If they fit, if they feel connected. I love that connection is part of what Jack was talking about because I think it is, I think he's just spot on. Connection is connection with our clients, connection with each other will change the law firm industry. What else? What other ideas do you all have about culture? We have five minutes left to talk. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Jana King. I'm Jana King Allen, and I work with Logan and Partners, along with Kelly Logan, and we have a few other team members here. And we are actually every team member is pretty much on a different continent. We have Brazil, Switzerland, U.S., and India, and the U.K. Um, and we've worked remotely the whole time, and it works. We're going over our values right now, putting them into place, coming up with. Um, phrases and descriptions. And my question is, you talked about the importance of culture fit versus culture add, like adding to your culture. But where does that intersect with values? Because you also need to make a value fit. I could see where you have like a culture add, but a value fit. I'm so glad you asked that. So the thing that we didn't have today was a values ranking exercise. So one of the things that we did that we came up with on that cruise when we figured out our hiring guidelines was giving people, candidates, a whole list of different values and asking them to rank them on what was most important to them. So the, the and we'll be able to get this to you because it's useful. I mean, we kind of wanted to be tricky because <laughs> we knew what hadn't worked in the past. We knew that if you, like we had a lawyer that was most concerned about her relationships within the industry and her reputation within the industry. And because of that, uh, she wasn't a great fit because she really wouldn't take um, brave, creative positions on behalf of her clients. She didn't want to look stupid in front of a judge. She really wanted to get along very well with opposing counsel. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if that is more important to you, than advocating on behalf of your client, that's not a good culture fit. So in our values ranking exercise, we had things like rank, you know, relationships with coworkers, relationships with clients, relationships with judges, relationships with the legal industry, reputation, outcomes, money, like what is most important to you so that we could decide, you know, how aligned are we? Yes. I have a question. Um, since most law firms are, I'm just, I don't need the microphone, I'm sorry, unless you really want me to have it. But um, um, since most law firms are virtual now, what are a few quick ideas that you can give for people to connect, um, you know, in a, in a, to, to expand their culture, to improve it? Yeah. So this has been challenging. Like we love work from home. But when people are isolated, first of all, the trauma that has gone on in the last two years has impacted every single one of us and our ability to have energy for our professional relationships because that energy has been spent figuring out how to homeschool our kids and take care of our parents and that's real. So how do you build relationships when we're virtual? Um, I have some ideas, but what are your ideas? Yeah. Yes. Hi, thank you. So my law firm, when COVID started, we created like Netflix groups, teams, I think, where you can watch movies at night and during the day. And we have, I don't know, it's a value, it's something called desk independence. 
So people are encouraged to move to different countries where they want to leave. The farm is paying for that for a year. And then what happens is during summer, we move the whole farm over there. So this farm, this year we were in Portugal. Next year we're going to Barcelona and we move the whole farm. The office is still here. We hire a temp or the receptionist stays or people with families who don't want to move. I mean, it's, you just don't go because you don't want to. But we encourage, um, you want to move somewhere, go find it out for a, for a week, for a month, for a year, then we're going to join you. But we're not joining you for the whole time, we're just joining for a month. And then we do the virtual movies, we do virtual cookings where you hire a chef, everyone, they'll ship all the cooking ingredients that you want. I'm sorry, my accent is different. If you don't understand, just ask me. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, the chef will all be on Zoom. The chef will explain everything you have to do. And we all cook together. We all eat. We talk about it the next day or the same day. And it's pretty cool. Now, without COVID, I mean, now we can be, all be together. People are still not in the office. We still have different activities we do every month. We do crock pot. Everyone has to bring a meal um, every other Friday. <laughs> Your favorite meal, we have people from different cultures, so you introduce a culture to us. Uh, what your, your food from your mother want is, like stuff like that. I think it's pretty cool, and it opens people up. I know. What else, what other, what other ideas do you all have for connecting while in a virtual world? I can answer my own question a little bit. I was just looking for additional ideas. But one thing that our law firm does is twice a month, we have team meetings on Zoom and your camera has to be on. And so that's kind of one way to personally connect. And then another thing is we use Slack. And a lot of times, instead of just slapping somebody, we'll do the, the slap call. So you're seeing them. Um, and, and, you know, so that has kind of helped us too to, um, you know, get to know each other better than if we were just sending a text or a message back and forth. Yeah, I do think that Slack, we use Slack, Slack's amazing. Video is almost as good as in person. And figuring out like, when do we video? When do we call? When do we text? Is I think an important thing to figure out how to connect. But there are a lot of things that people can do. Our, one of our managing attorneys organized a weight loss challenge and people bought in, like paid 20 bucks and they're having this competition. I'm not part of it, but like, there are things that you can do within your organization to engage even when you're virtual on things that you like. Like, for instance, there's another channel that people have in my law firm uh, called Modern Paw. And people love their pets at Modern Law. And so in the Modern Paw channel, they're sharing pictures and memes and, um, you know, Robin just got married and for her wedding, she asked for donations to an animal shelter and I think we're going to do a walk. So like figuring out the interests of your people and how to invest in those interests can really, I think, help build culture. Yes. Kind of to go off of that, I, I just wanted to ask you more about your retreat. Can you go into detail about that? Because that's something that we've been interested in, but we don't really know how to organize it. Yeah, so how many of you have read Traction? Okay, a good number of you. And you've heard of EOS. Well, EOS recommends that your leadership team have a quarterly retreat or half day meeting. Now, for a long time, we did that with the whole firm until we sort of outgrew that. And then we stopped doing our quarterly retreats. And now, you know, it's been a year and we stopped as a whole firm during the quarterly retreats and I think it was a mistake. So we're gonna go back to meeting in person every quarter for a half a day to do things that are not case related. They're going to be, their time that we get to know each other. Their time that we talk about the overall big picture of how the firm is doing. Are we moving in the right direction? How do we build relationships? How do we identify problems that we haven't solved yet? And how do we start solving them? So I think getting out of the office and setting aside a half a day, a quarter, there's a, if you read Traction, it has sample agendas. And if you're small enough, you can do that leadership team type agenda. If you're too big for that, then you can do a different type of retreat, like a workshop. Like I think one of the next things we're gonna do is bring in an Enneagram coach to map out 
our eight different personality types to get to know each other a little bit better to do the exercise that we talked about here as a group. I think we're about out of time, but thank you all so much for coming and I'd be happy to talk to you outside.